Hi, I'm Mike Scott and uh, thank you for joining me for this Zoom talk on and a question and answer in the Christian Shakespeare question mark series. This is sponsored by Georgetown University, Washington DC in association with Las Casas Institute for Human Dignity at Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford. Today's session will feature a talk for approximately 20 minutes by Molly Clark from Merton College, the University of Oxford, on Shakespeare and the morality plays, a formal heritage. This will be followed by approximately 30 minutes for questions and answers. From the moment that uh, Molly begins her talk, you will be able, by using your Q&A key at the bottom of your screen, type up any questions as we go along. And I urge you please to do so. We want as many questions as possible. These will be fed to me and I will put as many of them as I can uh, to Molly. If there are too many questions today coming through, then we will, uh, we will make sure that Molly receives them by email and hopefully she'll be able to answer them later. Today's talk is the 12th in the Christian Shakespeare question mark series. The earlier talks are available on YouTube. The series looks at the influence of the Elizabethan and Jacobean Christian environment on the writings of William Shakespeare. It's part of a larger project, The Future of the Humanities, which is promoted and supported by the Las Casas Institute for Human Dignity at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford, and by Georgetown University in conjunction with Georgetown's Humanities Initiative. The aim of the project is to explore through a series of high profile lectures, talks, conferences, seminars and symposia, the place of the humanities in continuing to develop an understanding of human life, dignity, equality and culture. Among the distinguished lectures are ones by the philosopher and literary critic, Professor T Terry Eagleton, art historian and director of the National Gallery London, Dr. Gabriele Finaldi, the former prime minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, and Dr. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury and current Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge. These are available on YouTube. One's in the pipeline for next year, depending, of course, on COVID-19, are the renowned historian Professor Diamond McCulloch on Thomas Cromwell and the equally renowned art historian Martin Kemp on Leonardo. So, to today's speaker. Molly Clark is one of the young generation of exciting researchers in English at Oxford University, where she is in her second year reading for her DPhil at Merton College, researching rhyme in Shakespeare's theater, on which she has already published an article in Oxford Research in English, and has another article on rhyme in mid 16th century drama, forthcoming in studies in philology. She's also gaining a name for herself as an established poet, having won the prestigious Newdigate Prize for Poetry in 2016. And I'm delighted that she's going to talk to us today on the morality plays and Shakespeare, a formal heritage. So with that, over to you, Molly. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction and thanks to everyone for having me. Um, I'm really delighted to be speaking as part of this, uh, this series. Um, in this paper, I'm going to be thinking about some of the formal tools that a Christian Shakespeare would have had at his disposal. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the dramatic convention of using differentiated verse form to signal moral or worthy speech. I'll begin by discussing the Protestant morality interludes of the mid 16th century, uh, a mode of theatre that differentiated sharply between good and evil speech using varied rhyme schemes. In the second half of my paper, I'll think about the ways in which Shakespeare responds to this convention. So, let's start with the morality interludes. I'm talking about works from the 1560s and 70s, uh, titles such as The Trial of Treasure, which you can see here, um, All for Money, or uh, the particularly catchy Like Will to Like, Quoth the Devil to the Collier. The morality interludes were homiletic and frequently featured a vice, uh, a tricksy figure, often humorous and interactive, representing particular immoral qualities and negatively influencing the course of the drama. These plays, and indeed the vast majority of plays that were being performed during Shakespeare's childhood, were written entirely in rhymed verse. Uh, 
prose and blank verse, the dominant modes of the later early modern theatre, hadn't yet caught on. These rhyming plays, performed in a dramatic language entirely grounded in verse form and its variation, relied on audiences' attention to oral structures and built up emotional or even instinctive associations between sound and content. In morality interludes, uh, we often see that good characters speak in one form and evil characters in another. For example, the good might use couplets and the evil might use ABAB or vice versa. As far as I can tell, um, there doesn't seem to have been a universally recognized paradigm for this. Um, it was more that each individual play had its own internal logic. In these kinds of plays, uh, we tend to see morally unimpeachable speech distinguished by a particular rhyme scheme throughout. The unassailable morality of the chosen verse form is frequently established right from the start in the prologue. In mid-century uh, mid drama, the prologue often summarised the precepts of the play that was to follow. Uh, it was the didactic pronouncement of a semi-authorial voice containing lines such as, therefore our matter is named the trial of treasure, which time doth expel with all mundane pleasure. And we often see uh, morality interludes observing a particular kind of logic. The good characters speak in the same verse form as the prologue and or epilogue. Quite frequently, this is rhyme royal, uh, that is an A, B, A, B, B, C, C rhyme scheme or something similar. It seems that in these morality interludes, individualized verse form is used to ascribe a universal moralizing voice, a hallmark to designate a worthy speaker. But it's not quite as simple as that. The prologue rhyme scheme is not always given to worthy characters so much as to worthy speech in general. This is exemplified most interestingly in The Trial of Treasure. This anonymous play of the 1560s was likely performed on tour by a small acting company. Professional theatre companies such as Leicester's Men were sponsored to spread homiletic messages around the country alongside their patron's good name. Uh, and Protestant plays like The Trial of Treasure would have been well represented in their repertory. In the story, Abstract noun characters are used to demonstrate Calvinist morality. Wayward lust, uh, himself rhymingly contrasted with the entirely virtuous just, gives way to the promptings of the vice, inclination, and other worldly cronies, and attempts to woo the lady, treasure. The bad characters, lust, inclination, and so on, tend to speak in ABAB rhyme, while the good, just sapiens and co, use the rhyme royal of the prologue. Occasionally, during the first scene, uh, just will subside into ABAB while talking to lust, but the same thing never happens the other way around. Soon enough, though, a quirk starts to emerge. Lust will occasionally deliver a rhyme royal stanza in the midst of his normal speech, and the content of these stanzas is each time characterised by classical allusion. Here's one of several examples. All men just? No, I remember the sentence of Tully that no man is just that feareth death, poverty, or pain, which I do fear all, and that marvellously, for fortune is variable, I do perceive plain. And notwithstanding that flicks possessed great gain, yet when Paul preached of the judgment day, he trembled for fear and bade him go away. Um, I had to do some digging to find out what flicks was referring to, uh, so if anyone has a better idea, let me know at the end. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's alluding to the hemorrhages and dysentery uh, from which St. Paul cured a man in Malta in the Book of Acts, uh, given that flicks was a variant spelling for flux common at this time. Um, the phrase bloody flicks uh, occurs in the Wycliffe Bible, for example, um, to describe these kinds of illnesses. Anyway, the point here is that lust is citing classical wisdom and even scripture. There are a few more examples of this throughout the play. Seemingly, in these moments, the tenor of Lust's language and frame of reference is deemed high-minded enough to require rhyme royal, even though his innate immorality remains unchanged. Perhaps some of these stanzas could be taken in isolation and used didactically, shedding the moral context of their unsavoury speaker. Alternatively, we could read this as a form of deception. Is Lust deliberately using the verse form of his enemies in order to convey sophistry uh, disguised as learning? <laughs> 
as Shakespeare would go on to write in The Merchant of Venice, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. It's unclear whether the character of lust is presented as capable of uttering worthy speech himself or as a sly imitator of it in others. The former explanation perhaps seems more likely when we consider another character in the same play. Sturdiness has been allied throughout most of the scenes with uh, the bad characters and accordingly tends towards ABAB Rome. However, at one point towards the end of the play, he's left alone on stage and seems to reveal that he is in fact good, delivering a worthy and didactic message to the audience. This transition is marked orally by a shift mid-speech from ABAB into Rome Royal. This lust is the image of all wicked men, which in seeking the world have all delectation. They regard not God nor his commandments ten, but are wholly led by their own inclination, first to inculcate with carnal cogitation, and after to the desire of all worldly treasure, which alone they esteem the fullness of pleasure. In this morality interlude and in others like it, rhyme is a didactic tool. Righteous language is orally marked out and differentiated from sinful. To what extent audiences would have been consciously aware of this is difficult to say, but it seems likely that over the course of a play, listeners would come to recognize instinctively when actors were talking in the manner of a good character or a bad. This clear cut approach to moral signaling is unsurprising in a genre peopled with abstract nouns who are Calvinistically fated for good or ill. But my examples demonstrate that the likes of lust and sturdiness can occasionally adopt different manners of speaking, lending an edge of nuanced complexity to the presentation of the elect and the damned. Rhyme shows us that speech can be changeable even when destiny is not. On the whole, the impression we get is of a drama governed by moral message rather than by character development. Rhyme instructs the audience as to which statements and modes of speech they should learn from and which abhor. So these were the kinds of plays that were touring the country during the childhood and adolescence of Shakespeare and his contemporaries. And that theatrical form didn't just transform overnight into what we now know as early modern drama. David Bevington, Robert Weiman, and many others uh, have shown the ways in which the troops of the mid 16th century theater carried over into the early modern. Alternating scenes between good and evil camps, characters whose names symbolize their vice or virtue, meta theatrical use of audience interaction. All these late medieval dramatic features are also familiar to us from the early modern corpus. The popularity of seven personified deadly sins uh, appearing, for example, in Dr. Faustus, as well as in the title of a Lost Queen's Men play, uh, testify to the enduring appeal of abstract noun characters. Shakespeare's own work reveals its awareness of what went before through occasional references. Feste's allusion to the old vice, Edmund's catastrophe of the old comedy. There are plenty of characters in Shakespeare that have attracted comparison with the old vice. But when it comes to verse form, they don't distinguish themselves like they used to. Immoral characters, uh, such as Edmund in King Lear or Iago in Othello, tend to be formally indistinguishable from moral characters in their speech and move between prose and blank verse according to the tonal requirements of the scene, rather than according to the worthiness of a particular utterance. Both of these characters, in fact, achieve their villainous ends through mimicry of worthy speech and its recognizable hallmarks hesitancy when disclosing the wrongdoing of others, for example. Another famous imitator of worthy speech is Richard III. Again, his blank verse means that he blends in with the rest of the cast of characters, moral and immoral. When he comes on at the beginning of the play, he seems at first as if he's playing the role of the prologue, objective and morally unimpeachable. He's alone and starts setting the scene by describing the glorious summer of the new king's reign. The expectation of some sort of prologue would have been especially strong given that another Richard III play, the anonymous true tragedy of Richard III, came out around the same time and featured an introductory scene spoken by the personified truth and poetry. Exactly the kinds of morally omniscient commentators that would have opened plays in the mid 16th century. Only in line 14 of Shakespeare's opening scene with the first instance of the first person in but I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, 
does it become clear that this is not an objective voice? We know that Shakespeare was comfortable with the conventional prologue form, as used in Henry V, for example. He's even willing to adopt the morality interludes convention when it comes to form. The lofty moral commentary of the sonnet prologue to Romeo and Juliet is immediately contrasted with the prose of the brawling serving men. The sonnet form then recurs in the wooing scene, uh, where the protagonists discuss the holy sanctity of their love. By contrast, Richard's soliloquy prologue blends into the ensuing scene with no formal differentiation. Shakespeare goes even further than some of his contemporaries in rejecting the easy moral teaching points that personified abstractions can offer. We're left confused about the information we've received. Is it meant as introductory plot summary or as an unguarded insight into the protagonist? It has several times been suggested that Richard, rather than being the prologue, is in fact another Shakespearean vice. Richard himself says, thus like the formal vice iniquity, I moralize two meanings in one word. Like the conventional vice, his speech is deceptive to other characters. But unlike that conventional vice, his speech uh, no longer has helpful formal differentiation from the play's worthy utterances. Verse form is no longer acting as a signal for morality. So, while there's a lot of continuity between the morality interludes and Shakespeare's work, there's clearly a lot that's changed too. Rhyme is no longer the norm for dramatic language, but rather a sort of special effect used to convey particular moods on a local level. Verse form is no longer the foundation on which the structures of character and plot were built to quite the same extent. But authors and audiences could not so quickly unlearn the patterns that they'd been trained to perceive. I think it's worth remembering that inbuilt association between morality and verse form when we read the morally ambiguous and famously motiveless characters of Shakespeare's plays. I should say at this point uh, that one relationship between character and verse form in Shakespearean drama has already been well documented, and that's status. It's pretty universally known as a general rule that working class characters tend to speak in prose and upper class or heroic ones in verse. Um, this kind of hierarchical differentiation definitely exists in Shakespeare's plays, uh, with exceptions, of course. And it's also something that was inherited from mid 16th century rhyming drama. But I think it's worth remembering that behind this clear cut class distinction, there's this other convention lurking in the living memory of early modern playwrights the differentiation according to morality. Where the two overlap, it's easy to assume that status is the key factor. But I'd like to finish by thinking about the implications of reading these moments the other way. Some of the best examples come in Henry IV. Prince Hal speaks in blank verse when talking to his father, the king, and when soliloquizing or discussing matters of state but he generally speaks in prose when talking to Falstaff and the rest of the East Cheap gang. In other words, he knows that in order to act like a prince, he must speak like a prince. But when he's having fun in the tavern, he chooses to immerse himself fully in the setting, an immersion that Shakespeare represents through form. At one point, when Hal's snobbishly mocking the way uh, that a servant talks, he says, I can drink with any tinker in his own language. He means that he's observed the way that working class people talk and can mimic them. But in fact, he's gone beyond mimicry. His behavior is indistinguishable from the tinkers and robbers in the tavern. And his indistinguishable behavior is mirrored by his indistinguishable prose form. An additional way of looking at this is that Shakespeare is using verse form to mirror Hal's moral and religious development. At the end of one prose tavern scene, Hal switches to blank verse for this soliloquy, which begins like this. I know you all and will a while uphold the unyoked humour of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty for, from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapours that did seem to strangle him. He's talking about the fact that he's soon going to lay aside his dissolute life and step into the role of prince. But it's not only a political and social change that he's pondering, 
It's also a moral one. He plans to lay aside idleness and all things base, contagious, foul and ugly. He's consulting his own conscience and recognising the immorality of his current lifestyle. The fact that he's blaming this immorality on his friends rather than on himself, of course, shows that he still has a long way to go in his development. So does the verse form. The way Hal switches between two different forms reflects his hypocrisy. His moral character is hanging in the balance, yet to be decided. The fact that he soliloquizes in blank verse, however, shows that he has the potential to come down on the right side. So, in Prince Hal, we see an example of a character deliberately adopting a speech style that is immoral within the context of the play. But it can also work the other way around, like it used to do in the morality interludes. In Act 3 of Part 1, we see Hal becoming serious enough about fighting to defend his father's rule that he actually lets it intrude into his fun tavern life. After a prose scene full of the usual pranks and rough jokes, Hal suddenly switches to verse. In this speech, he's giving orders about preparing for the war. He's inhabiting his role as prince. He finishes with this rhyming couplet. The land is burning, Percy stands on high, and either we or they must lower lie. This is a very impactful end uh, to the speech. The rhyme accentuates the sense of a turning point, an ultimatum that either the king's army or the rebels are going to have to die in this war. The couplet kind of has the wind taken out of it by Falstaff, though, who very unusually uh, speaks in verse to end this scene. He uses a rhyming couplet too. Rare words, brave world, Hostess, my breakfast, come. Oh, I could wish this tavern were my drum. In other words, he wishes that he could recruit soldiers and fight the war without having to leave the pub. The fact that he mimics Hal's verse form could be interpreted in different ways, I think. On the one hand, Shakespeare could be humorously showing how superficial Prince Hal's transformation is. Anyone can speak heroically, even Falstaff, but actually being heroic is another matter. On the other hand, it could be showing how far Hal has come. He now really is taking his role as prince seriously, fighting for his father's crown. Falstaff, by contrast, can't see the seriousness of the situation and talks about breakfast in the same way that Hal talks about life and death. The indicators of moral speech are no longer certain. As I mentioned before, both these moments could be envisioned in terms of status rather than morality. But I think considering them both ways leads to a richer understanding of what Shakespeare is doing with these characters and with the fraught relationship between thought and speech. It's also worth bearing in mind uh, that the knight, Sir John Falstaff, is hardly a working class character. It's his dissolute lifestyle that has conditioned his manner of speaking within the play, not his social status. It is primarily a moral development that Hal undergoes throughout the two part play. It's also important to bear in mind that morally differentiated verse form still occasionally surfaces in the early modern theatre. Uh, for example, in Thomas Hayward's 1599 plays of Edward IV, we see the lecherous, rakish king use prose whenever he makes bawdy remarks, uh, even in the scene, uh, scenes where the rest of the royal household are using blank verse. Even by the turn of the century, audiences were still expected to derive moral meaning from playwrights' formal choices. So, uh, I hope I've given a brief sense of one way in which Shakespeare would have experienced religious didacticism in the drama he grew up with. The homiletic messages of the mid 16th century morality interludes were intrinsically bound up with rhyme. Following in this tradition, Shakespeare does exploit the ideas surrounding verse form as moral indicator, as we've seen in Henry IV. But he never does it consistently enough for it to become an easy set of guidelines. Verse form is one strand of the complex moral web that Shakespeare weaves, in which good and evil are seldom clear cut. Thank you very much. Thanks, Molly. Uh, that was great. I enjoyed that very much. I, I wonder um, if I can start off. We're getting some questions coming through as they come through. Can I can I start off by asking you to what extent do you consider that the vice's interaction uh, is with the audience and that there's a kind of an improvisation that also goes on, which uh, within the morality play. Um, yes, that's definitely the case. Um, yeah, the vice would often have um, 
interacted directly with the audience sometimes for kind of practical reasons in that he would have been asking them to move out of the way to kind of clear the way for the actors and sometimes in a more um, kind of dramatic sort of meta theatrical way um, and we do see this carrying over into the characters that you know people like Spivak have identified in Shakespeare as being vice vice like um, you know Iago um, asking the audience whether they think see him as a villain and things like that. Um, I think that that kind of um, atmosphere of uh, audience interaction and as you say improvisation actually carries over most interestingly in a more comic strain um, in the form of the uh, clown and fool um, into the Shakespearean theatre um, because uh, actually um, so clowns so sort of Elizabethan clowns like Tarleton and then you know through the progression um, Rob uh, Shakespearean clowns like Robert Armin um, would have had um, interactive and improvisatory exchanges with the audience um, sometimes before or after or sometimes during the play and this is another way in which um, rhyme is quite important because um, they would have often been rhymed quips so the audience would uh, an audience member would shout something out and then the fool or clown would have to would respond uh, with an improvised um, couplet um, so I think in some ways that's where we see perhaps the, the most logical continuation of that kind of vice-like interaction, not just in the, the evil, vicious characters, but also in the comic ones. Um, and then I actually, I think that Shakespeare really makes use of um, this and is kind of influenced in some of his fool characters um, by this, this tradition of uh, improvised rhyming. Um, you know, the fool in Lear, for example, um, you know, with his um, really sort of topsy-turvy rhymes is an important part of this sort of horrible amoral universe where nonsense is kind of the only sense that you actually can derive or only meaning you can derive. Great, thanks very much. I've got a question here from uh, Jasmine Jones. Do you think Shakespeare was exposed to the late medieval morality plays, e.g. Everyman, as well as one's contemporary to his lifetime? Um, I'm afraid I, I don't know, you know, particularly which plays he might have seen, and I'll, I might ask Mike if he's got any contributions on this, but I think it's, it's generally thought that given that Shakespeare lived near enough to Coventry, it it's, it's, tends to be assumed that he would have had the opportunity to see um, plays like this, um, because that was, you know, quite a centre of um, public theatre um, and you know certainly plays during his childhood would have been touring around um, the country that was you know something that sort of slightly started dying out a bit but you know in Shakespeare's childhood that would have still been something that happened I mean some people some people even think that you know Shakespeare um, you know briefly joined the Queen's men when they were touring um, and you know spent some time as an actor with them there are kind of different theories about that. Um, so I, I think it's it's very likely that he would have, yeah, seen some of these mid 16th century morality plays. Um, Mike, I don't know if you've got any other yeah, thoughts yeah, on no, that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think uh, although, although the, the Catholic plays were uh, supposedly banned, I think it still was going on for quite a time. Ken, Henry VIII wasn't just allowed to chop it off you know, and, uh, and so I think some of the mystery cycles, you might have even seen some mm -hmm. mystery cycles or, or elements of the mystery cycles as we went on. Yes, I, I, uh, I wonder about um, a Midsummer Night's Dream. Paul Edmondson has, has asked me about this. Within a Midsummer Night's Dream, there are, there are a number of verse forms, as you probably realise, that's going on. How do you, how do you think that, 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 links in with your with your interpretation um yeah i think that's that's a really good um showcase of you know the very very deliberate way in which shakespeare was using different verse forms so um yeah obviously the um blank verse of the kind of um lovers the um prose of the mechanicals and then possibly most interestingly um i know robert stagg who's who's at Oxford um, has written on the kind of um, specific 
uh, the sort of form that's specific to fairies and witches and wizards yeah. <laughs> in Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, the kind of uh, the seven syllable um, line, um, which, you know, I think that's, that's just such a clear um, proof that, that Shakespeare was, well, which I'm sure no one's denying, but <laughs> that um, Shakespeare was using verse form in a way that was not just based on the kind of poetic or sort of tonal requirements of particular moments, but was also um, bound up with character and character type. Um, and then obviously, you know, I, I think that really um, has a wonderfully kind of um, multiplicitous feel in the world of that play with, with everyone kind of running around in, in this very confused way and um, you know all levels of society all levels of uh, <laughs> magical ability all um, kind of muddled in together I think I think that's a, a really beautiful play to have brought up in this context. Okay thanks very much. Uh, Catherine uh, Temple asks could you could you speak a, a bit about the lines between poetry and prose might at times have been blurred is there always a clear demarcation or perhaps clear demarcations in themselves have a meaning if at times the demarcation is blurred? That's really interesting. Um, certainly, um, they're very blurred to a kind of um, modern scholar trying to, trying to work them out because very often in um, the sort of first printings of a lot of plays, or a lot of early modern plays, um, you would get um, verse printed as prose and sometimes even vice versa. I mean, usually in the form of case, it's, it's probably to save on space, but it does, it does suggest that um, it is not something that at least the printers were, were you know, thinking was an important distinction. Um, I think, I mean, I feel like to the ear of an early modern audience member, they would have been fairly distinct just because um, they were so much more exposed to it than we are now. I think I find it hard to believe that they didn't on some possibly even subconscious level um, notice the difference. Um, I'm just trying to think if there were a kind of, yeah, I mean, there are these quite, quite rapid shifts um, between the two forms. Um, as I've said, you know, in Henry IV and also in, um, Haywood's Edward the Fourth that I mentioned, you know, it's really quite striking that um, the king will be saying some kind of gross stuff about you know, how he's about off to impregnate someone or whatever, um, and it, that will be in prose. And then you know his mother will respond to him in blank verse, and then he'll reply in prose. You know, it's quite it's quite unusual to see that really quick fire um, flipping between the two. But the fact that it does happen and the fact that it happens with such clearly content based delib deliberateness um, shows that I, I think there must have been an awareness in the audience of the differentiation between the two. Um, but no, certainly, certainly there in, um, in printing and in, in manuscripts, there was there was blurring and it's kind of impossible to know whether that's because um, uh, the people who were writing or printing didn't care and or didn't notice the difference or whether it was just because they assumed that to the ear the difference would be so obvious that they didn't need to signal it with yeah. lineation. Okay thanks very much. Another one here from Casey, uh, Casey O'Donnell. Thank you for your wonderful lecture Molly. In the morality plays as well as Shakespeare's plays is there a revision that the particular verse form employed for virtue versus vice was chosen? I.e., does the rhyme royal somehow sound virtuous or is it somewhat arbitrary chosen and simply communicates virtue vice because of the constituent internal logic of the play? That's an interesting one. Mm. And I think that uh, Rape of Lucrece, of course, is written in rhyme royal. Mm. You know, Shakespeare shows that you can you can write a whole whole poem in that. But carry on. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's thank you, Casey. That's a really really interesting question, and it's definitely one that I've been kind of 
pondering for a long time. Um, I think in terms of Rhyme Royal, the fact that it's called Rhyme Royal um, is probably, is possibly relevant. Um, you know, you do see it being used quite often for high status and kind of magnanimous figures. Um, you know, even in um, The Mirror for Magistrates, which is a verse, a collection of poems, um, in at least the first part of it, you see that, um, oh wait, no, I'm, I'm talking rubbish here actually. Yeah, the, the, every, you know, the, everyone else is in Rhyme Royal and then uh, the kings are in a kind of extra, even more interlocked version of Rhyme Royal. So that's actually the opposite of what I was just saying. But, but no, in, um, in some uh, plays we do see, you know, some earlier ones, even than the ones I was discussing, you see figures like, you know, Jupiter or, you know, very high status figures speaking in Rhyme Royal. And I think the royalty of it is, is important. But then again, um, there is another uh, play from the mid 16th century period called Horestes, um, where the vice speaks in Rhyme Royal and everyone else speaks in a different form. So, you know... You were the, making that point earlier, weren't you, that, uh, that, that it, was the, it was the change. That there wasn't a consistency. Yeah. Yes. There yeah. really doesn't, doesn't seem to be. I mean, I would, I would really be interested, you know, if, if anyone had ideas about whether there's a kind of innately worthy sound. To, I, I suppose ambitious verse forms sometimes have a sense of um, kind of worthiness because, and that's what happens in the mirror for magistrates, you know, the more complex the verse form, the yeah. higher authority the figure. But um, there really doesn't seem to be, I, I mean, in terms of meter, there are some slightly more obvious distinctions, like quite often um, you'll get really quite doggerel, um, very rough meter um, for a kind of immoral characters or sometimes for the lower status characters. Um, contrasted with slightly smoother meter for the others, but again, it's it's really not clear cut, and each each play does almost seem to decide for itself what the conventions are. But yeah, that's really that's really interesting. Um, Neil Blivin takes uh, takes this on a little bit further. He said, "Did Shakespeare or others go beyond a duality and use more than two verse forms in order to differentiate between gradations of morality?" Um, yeah, I, that's very interesting. I, I suppose go back to if we go back to Robert Stagg's argument about the, the sort of supernatural um, meter. Um, I guess that's an example of a verse form that's <laughs> kind of putting yet another plane of being above even the mortal categories of good and evil. Um, so that's that's one example. Um, there are also I'm just trying to think other examples. So in um, in Cymbeline we get um, a moment where um, Posthumus gets a sort of vision from, of, of his ancestors. And um, if I remember rightly, they speak in um, sort of 14 couplets, which is this quite old fashioned um, verse form. So they're partly signaling their, the fact that they're from the past, <laughs> they're sort of off of history um, because they're using this historic verse form. Um, but it's also, I think, setting them apart in this sort of rarefied, world in which they've kind of they've played their part and now they're here to give this um this message um to their descendant and the verse form kind of signals that that rarefied separateness and then actually then jupiter chips in and he's um i think possibly speaking in a b a b um and again you know this is something you don't see that much in shakespeare um you get this um sense of a really different voice that perhaps needs to be listened to with greater um, reverence than than the other voices. I mean, another, the kind of the places where you see most metrical or sorry, um, formal variation are often in the songs um, in early modern drama, um, and you get a lot of um, you know quite intricate stuff going on with the verse forms in songs. Um, which obviously is just an entirely different mode of communication, um, but still a verbal one. And, you know, perhaps in some ways almost inheriting the function of, the sort of classical function of chorus figures, kind of giving, conveying messages, but in a, in a different and sort of refreshing way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
Benjamin Card says, hello, Molly. Thanks very much for your talk. I was wondering if there's anything to say about prose versus verse in the Bible, for instance, with the book of Psalms, and if that early modern conversation resembles at all what's going on on stage. Oh, thank you, Ben. That's really, that's really fascinating and not something I've thought about at all. Um, yes, I suppose the verse of the Psalms is very, because we're reading them as songs of David, I suppose it puts a degree of emphasis on voice. I don't know if that's, if that's right or if I'm just making that up really, but I feel like um, when verse is employed in that way, um, there's a real sense of someone, you know, crying out in usually distress sometimes in um, celebration that really almost, yeah, gives, gives this emphasis on the voice. And, you know, things like Isaiah, um, again, this sort of voice crying, I know he's not the voice crying in the wilderness, but you know, that, um, that kind of sense of prophecy as being this outpouring of speech, um, but in a way that's written. Whereas, I mean, obviously the, you know, the prose sections of the Bible have a lot of voices in them, but in the, in the kind of overarching texture of the, um, is of the language is more conveying conveying information rather than just directly channeling this emotive voice. Um, I don't know if that really if that really is a satisfactory answer, Mike. I wonder if you have any additions to that. I think that's fine. That's a uh, you know that's uh, that was a really complex question and needs mm. a needs a needs a lot of thought. I think uh, to go through that, but I think there's something there behind that that question which is very interesting. Nuno uh, Mireles says uh, uh, he'd like to ask you nowadays how the difference between verse forms would be stressed in performance, or in other words, how it, how would it be deliberately delivered? It's an interesting question. Moving to the actual concept of uh, of, of performance, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't know if that's kind of a question of how I sort of think it should be performed or how, how it is, but you know, not that there's necessarily a differentiation, but I, I do find it interesting that um, I think nowadays quite a lot of people are embarrassed by the Roman couplets in Shakespeare and um, try and sort of say them a bit um, quickly <laughs> with a slight smile uh, to kind of uh, get them out of the way and, you know, sometimes you know the way that when you're reading a poem you can either choose to emphasize the rhyme or you can sort of elide it in with the next line i think it's possibly more fashionable to try and do the the latter because you know we've got such a um you know such an understandable desire for shakespeare to be realistic and to speak to us in a natural way um and so i think verse form can sometimes, you know, rhyme particularly can sometimes prove problematic for that. Um, I think blank verse, I do, I do subscribe to the, to the general idea that, that blank verse sounds like speech, even though it's, you know, not as much as prose. Um, but I think it has a certain, you know, obviously a measured quality to it that does, that is set apart from prose. Um, I think sometimes I've, I've seen some of the best productions I've seen in terms of the speaking of the verse um, have really not shied away from the the rhythmicality of it. Um, for, for example, um, I saw a really amazing production of Marlowe's Tamburlaine um, in, in Stratford. Um, I think the, the act playing Tamburlaine was called uh, Jude or Wuzu, if I'm not wrong. And, um, you know, obviously Marlowe is so kind of sonorous and has so many repetitions so many um you know successive lines with the same word at the end um and he really kind of embraced that and um it all just sounded so beautifully momentous but also so so realistic somehow at the same time um i think i think that's that's what i'd that's what i like best is when it, you can you kind of do both you you really work with the verse 
or the first prose distinctions that Shakespeare has given you, but you you somehow you keep acting you act at the same time you're kind of not you're not doing a recitation you're you're really conveying the the meaning and emotion of the words at the same time i suppose molly that uh, a good director might be able to see the change of, of verse form uh, as almost a, a way of creating an alienation effect to break up deliberately you know to make you think about what has happened i think you're making those uh uh those those points when you're saying you know that uh for example uh, um once more to the breach dear friends uh, after that that speech then uh and then the, the 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 men come on and they deliberately they deliberately parody what's what's being said and shakespeare's constantly doing that uh, mm. do you think he yeah. does it through the verse forms or just through characterization yeah no I, I agree definitely um definitely through the verse forms and you know it's i suppose it's kind of difficult to tell because obviously from a structural perspective it makes sense to have you know one scene with your your rustic characters and one scene with your courtly characters and kind of intersperse them so it's a little bit you can't say for definite that it's the change in verse form that's having that refreshing effect but i think sometimes it really clearly is um and you know i'm just thinking of uh, i think it's part two of henry the sixth where we um are seeing jack cade's rebellion and um there's a kind of really short quick fire scenes with everyone running around and um cade and his followers are speaking in prose apart from when cade um sort of steps up into this more um uh, kind of an um, annunciatory um, tone where he's kind of um, really inhabiting the role of leader and he's kind of making these very public speeches when he switches to blank verse and I think um, I think a change in verse form or prose versus verse is always going to have an effect on audience attention you know it's uh, the same way as if um, I suddenly started speaking in a much louder voice you know or in a um much slower pace or something it's 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 the same thing that it, it really catches at your ear and can offer moments of um kind of refreshment um and kind of zooming in or zooming out <laughs> not to overuse the word zoom um but I, I think um i think you're right that it can sometimes be be almost distancing you know if we've been really immersed in prose which is quite a nitty-gritty kind of form and then we almost step back into this um more pro proclamatory verse um i think that can have um a distancing effect and as you say you know the transition from um the st crispin's day which is you know which is obviously emotive and everything but is is very public and then you kind of focus down into these um these more intimate prose and, and then obviously um how when he goes among the soldiers and he's he's then talking in prose and it's these much quieter one-on-one -on -one encounters um which is you know very much contrasted with his um oration in verse Billy Arnott says, do we know if the didactic verse was italicized in morality plays, like the use of italicized sentenciae in later plays, such as John Marston's The Malcontent, and whether or not the vice figures speaking in verse are then doing so ironically, like they might be in John Marston? That's Marston's. really interesting. Yeah, um, in the, I haven't, as far as I can remember, I haven't seen that being done in um, in the printed early printed editions that I've seen of uh, you know these some of these 1560s and 70s plays possibly because I feel like quite often in you know some of these early modern plays it's quite often a couplet isn't it that's italicized or else has the little asterisks beside it to kind of say oh put put me in your commonplace book um, and I feel like when when everything is in rhyme, I feel like perhaps 
things feel a little bit less um, easily extractable. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, that might be a generalization, but certainly, you know, the example I quoted from um, the trial of treasure where lust is saying that sort of dubiously didactic uh, stanza, that's, that's not typographically differentiated in any way. Um, it's purely the verse form is the only differentiation that we're getting. Yes, and of course, uh, the, the actors are uh, acting from roles, not uh, not from a printed uh, not from a printed uh, script. So, uh, I, I I'm not too sure that they they're giving signs to the actors there. That uh, that's that's something that's coming from the editor maybe later mm -hmm. later on. Okay, let's let's uh, turn to uh, uh, some uh, Tony Campbell. Great job, Molly. Could you talk about the impact of English blasphemy laws before and during Shakespeare's life? Did Shakespeare skirt these laws through the double entendre? I think Shakespeare's characters become increasing multidimensional as Shakespeare evolved as a writer. Also, I think Flix refers to something vulgar as it does today. Mm. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm obviously very innocent. I've never heard this, <laughs> this vulgar connotation, but thank you. I will, in, in private, I will, I will Google that afterwards. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but yeah, that's a very interesting question about the, um, so for example, the, yeah, the 1606 law to restrain the abuses of players or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, the removal of the word God and uh, anything that refers to um, God, even like wounds, God's wounds, um, from plays. Um, yeah, I think it does have have kind of interesting local effects. Um, I've kind of only thought about it before in terms of rhyme. The way that kind of quite often internal rhyme is actually lost in the folio when uh, when these words that were in the original quarto have been changed. So when God is changed to heaven, or wounds is changed or just taken out, sometimes. Um, sometimes there's quite a lot of assonance that's, that's then lost. Um, I haven't ever thought about it before in terms of, on a, on a macro level, in terms of um, characterization. Um, that's very interesting. I wonder if, you know, the colourful blasphemous language of some of the earlier um, characters, sort of more swashbuckling kind of characters, has to be replaced with a more insidious form of uh, kind of dodginess in a way. You can't, you can't, you can't convey dodginess through swear words in the same way anymore. Um, I'm just trying to think of examples from the late plays. I mean, um, I suppose Leontes, you, when he's you know talking in really horribly about Hermione and using all these really grotesque, um, you know, uh, phrases to describe her supposed adultery. Um, it's really very much based on imagery rather than on words that have kind of lost their meaning in themselves, but, but convey this slightly sweary <laughs> vibe. Um, yeah, I'll think about that more. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Fast, uh, thanks for the excellent talk. You spoke very ably about the way that the Calvinist morality plays utilise verse form to present their deterministic theology. Do you see a difference in the speech patterns of earlier plays written prior to the church splitting, such as Mankind, that reflects a particular Catholic theology? And do you see any inheritance from those plays in the verse structure of Shakespeare's work? thinking here about earlier comments regarding the Coventry plays. Mm. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I should admit at this point, I'm really not, not a medievalist at all. So I uh, haven't read that extensively um, earlier than what I've been talking about. Um, but yeah, from, from the little I've read, um, there does seem to be a very similar um, kind of tightrope or trapeze act with verse form. There seems to be a lot of, a lot of variation and often you know, quite differentiated language according to class and then according to 
um, you know, status and things like that. Um, perhaps in terms of kind of Catholic liturgy, I would actually love to hear from Mike because I know he works on this area and I would genuinely be interested if you think, um, if you think Shakespeare has, you know, got any inheritance from these kinds of liturgical language in the Catholic plays. I think that, uh, that Shakespeare uh, cer certainly was well aware of Catholic uh, liturgical service. Um, and I think that you find that, um, uh, that he's certainly, uh, certainly aware of, of sacramental uh, within the actions, you know, so that uh, I would find within Hamlet all the seven Catholic, uh, Catholic sacraments, but they, they would be all kind of jumbled up you know, the, but uh, it's, it's like a it's like a wasteland um, uh, of the debris of Catholic sacramentalism. I don't think he is making any other point than that it is a wasteland, um, and what that might imply for uh, for the land of Denmark at the time, maybe. But but you can, you can't tell. But he certainly, you know, I think uh, I think those those critics who have pointed particularly to the influence of, of Mary Arden on, uh, on, on, on Shakespeare is, is the, and, and, uh, and, and, and he's growing up within a Catholic, Catholic uh, family. I, th I think that's a, a very prevalent um, point of view, a good point of view to, to have a look at. As far as the early, uh, as far as the early uh, morality plays are concerned, yeah, I think there are there are there are polarities in, uh, and there are references references back, you know, as with Paroles, as with Iago, as with Richard Richard the Third, as as you've said. There are other questions, but I'm afraid we're running out of uh, we're running out of time. So I think what I must do now is uh, is go into into my thank yous and say, Molly. Thank you very much for answering those questions. Thank you very much for a really engaging, engaging talk. Um, I'm sure this is going to go on uh, and your research is going to find out more things and, and that maybe you'll come back and, and talk to us again on an, another occasion, but uh, I thoroughly, really enjoyed it. Can I thank all the participants who submitted questions? I'm sorry I haven't been able to get through all of the questions, but, uh, but we've tried to answer them and, and Molly will get back to those who, who haven't, uh, haven't had a, an answer from her today. Um, thanks to uh, all at Georgetown University who have made this happen, especially Yvonne Quack and colleagues working uh, to make Zoom possible. Special thanks to uh, Professor Catherine Temple for her work behind the scenes in feeding questions to me. My thanks as ever to Paul, Dr. Paul Edmondson of the Shakespeare Birthday Birthday Place Trust uh, for his support of this series, and to my joint co coordinator, Dr. Yvette Curry at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Thanks to other Blackfriars colleagues, Dr. Richard Finn, uh, the director of the Las Casas Institute, David Goodhill, our acting regent, Claire Broom Saunders, our senior tutor, and Kinga Rona Gabnai, our UK administrator. At Georgetown, my thanks to Dr. Jack DeJoy, the president, Tom Banchoff, vice president, Chris Chalenza, dean of the Georgetown College. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, being part of today's, today's audience. I think that we've got a record number uh, today, uh, which, is, which is great to see. Uh, please join us again at the same time on the 16th of June for John Drakakis, the University of Stirling, Scotland, talking on putting religion to the question, some reflections on Shakespeare's second tetralogy and his Venetian plays. John is, a, as you well know, I'm sure, a cultural materialist and never one to fear controversy. And he's one of the leading Shakespearean scholars of our generation, meticulous, learned, and always engaging. And it should prove uh, a great session and one not to be missed. In the meantime, take care, keep safe, 